Woman in Socialism by August Bebel, Chapter 13, Woman in Industry. 1. Development and Extension of Female Labor. The endeavor of women to earn their own living and to attain personal independence is, to some extent at least, regarded as as a just one by bourgeois society. The bourgeoisie requires an unhampered release of male and female labor power in order that industry may attain its highest degree of development. The perfection of machinery in the division of labor, whereby each single function in the process of production requires less strength and mechanical training than formerly, and the growing competition not only between individual manufacturers, but also between entire manufacturing regions, states, and countries, causes the labor power of women to be sought more and more. The special causes which lead to an increased employment of female labor in a growing number of trades have been set forth in a previous chapter. One reason why employers resort more and more to the employment of women besides men, or instead of men, is that women are accustomed to require less than men. Owing to their nature as sex beings, women are obliged to offer their labor power cheaper than men. They are, as a rule, more subjected to physical derangements that cause an interruption of their work. And owing to the complication and organization of modern industry, this may lead to an interruption in the whole process of production. Pregnancy and childbirth lengthen such periods of interruption. The employer makes the most of this fact and finds ample indemnification for these occasional interruptions by the payment of considerably lower wages. Moreover, the woman is tied to her particular abode or its immediate environment. She cannot change her abode as men are unable to do in most cases. Female labor, especially the labor of married women workers, appears particularly desirable to employers in still another way as may be seen from the quotation from Capital by Karl Marx on page 129. As a worker, the married woman is far more attentive and docile than the unmarried one. Consideration for her children compels her to exert her strength to the utmost in order to earn what is needful for their livelihood, and she therefore quietly submits to much that the unmarried working woman would not submit to, far less so the working man. As a result, working women rarely combine with their fellow workers to obtain better working conditions. That also enhances their value in the eyes of the employers. Sometimes they even are a good means to subdue rebellious male workers. Women, moreover, are more patient. They possess greater nimbleness and a more developed taste, qualities that make them better suited to many kinds of work than men. These womanly virtues, the virtuous capitalist appreciates fully, and so with development of industry, the field of women's work is extended each year. But, and this is the decisive factor, without materially improving her social condition. Where female labor power is employed, it frequently releases male labor power. But the displaced male workers must earn their living, so they offer their labor power at lower wages, and this offer again depresses the wages of the female workers. The depression of wages becomes a screw set in motion by the constantly revolving process of developing industry. And as this process of revolution by labor-saving devices also releases female workers, the supply of hands is increased still more. New branches of industry counteract this constant production of surplus labor power, but not sufficiently to create better conditions of labor. In the new branches of industry also, as for instance in the electrical, male workers are being displaced by female workers. In the motor factory of the General Electric Company, most of the machines are tended by girls. Every increase in wages above a certain standard causes the employer to seek further improvement of his machinery and to put the automatic machine in the place of human hands and human brains. In the beginning of the capitalistic era, only male workers competed with one another on the labor market. Now, sex is arrayed against sex, and age against age. Women displace men, and women in turn are displaced by young people and children. That is the moral regime of modern industry. 
This state of affairs would eventually become unbearable if the workers, by organization in their trade unions, would not counteract it with all their might. To the working woman, too, it is becoming a sheer necessity to join these industrial organizations, for as an individual she is still far less power of resistance than the working man. Working women are beginning to recognize this necessity. In Germany, the following numbers were organized. In 1892, 4,355. In 1899, 19,280. In 1900, 22,884. In 1905, 74,411. In 1907, 136,929. In 1908, 138,443. In 1892, women constituted only 1.8% of all members of trade unions. In 1908, they constituted 7.6%. According to the Fifth International Report of the Trade Union Movement, the numbers of female members were in Great Britain, 201,709. In France, 88,906 in Austria, 46,401. The endeavors of employers to lengthen the workday in order to extract larger profits from their workers is met with little resistance by women workers. That explains why in the textile industry, for instance, in which more than half of the workers are women, the workday is longest. It was necessary, therefore, that government protection by limiting the hours of work should begin with this industry. Women being accustomed to an endless workday by their domestic activity submit to the increased demands upon their labor power without offering resistance. In other trades, such as millinery, manufacture of artificial flowers, etc., they reduce their own wages and lengthen their own workday by taking home extra work. They frequently do not even notice that thereby they become their own com competitors and do not earn more in a 16-hour day than they might in a well-regulated 10-hour day. There's a bunch of tables and different shit like that that I'm not going to go over because it's weird to try and read that. Two, factory work of married women, sweatshop labor, and dangerous occupations. Married women form a large percentage of working women and their number is steadily increasing which means a serious problem in regard to the family life of the working class. In 1899, German factory inspectors were instructed to investigate the work of married women and to inquire into the causes which led them to seek employment. This investigation showed that 229,334 married women were employed in factories. Besides, 1,063 married women were employed in mining above the ground, as was shown by the report of the Prussian Mining Authorities. In Baden, the number of married working women increased from 10,878 in 1894 to 15,046 in 1899, which is 31.27% of all the adult female workers. Besides the textile industry, the manufacture of articles of food and luxury, especially the manufacture of tobacco, gives many married women employment. Then comes the paper industry, especially employment in workshops for the assorting of rags and employment in brickyards. Married women are mainly employed in difficult occupations, quarries, brickyards, dyeing establishments, manufacture of chemicals, sugar refineries, etc implying hard and dirty work, while young working girls under 21 find employment in porcelain factories, spinning and weaving mills, paper mills, cigar factories, and in the clothing trade. The worst kinds of work, shunned by others, are taken up by the elder working women, especially the married ones. Of the many replies in regard to the causes which lead married women to seek work, only a few need to be mentioned. In the district of Postem, the main reason given for the factory labor of married women was that the earnings of the men were insufficient. In Berlin, according to the reports of two inspectors, 53.62% of the women who helped to support their families stated that the earnings of their husbands were insufficient to support them. Similar information was given by the factory inspectors for the districts of Western Prussia, Frankfurt on the Otter, Franconia, Württemberg, 
El Satia, etc. The inspector for Magdeburg gives the same cause for the majority of married working women, but also states that some married women must work because their husbands are dissolute and spend all their earnings on themselves. Others, again, it was reported, worked as a matter of habit and because they had not been trained to be housekeepers. It may be true that these causes hold good in a minority of cases, but the great majority of these women work because they must. The factory inspector for Alsace states as the main cause for gainful employment of married women in modern industry, the demand for cheap labor created by the means of transportation and by unrestric unrestricted competition. He furthermore states that manufacturers like to employ married women because they are more reliable and steady. The factory inspector for Baden, Dr. War Schaffer, says, the low wages paid to women workers is the main cause why employers resort to female labor wherever it can be made use of. Ample proof of this assertion can be found in the fact that wages are lowest in those industries in which the greatest number of women are employed. As female labor can be employed to a greater extent in these industries, it becomes a necessity to the working class families that the women should seek employment. The factory inspector for Koblenz says, Women usually are more industrious and reliable than young girls. Young working girls generally have an aversion against disagreeable and dirty work, which is accordingly left to the more unassuming married workers. Thus, for instance, dealers in regs frequently employ married women. That the wages of working women are lower everywhere than those of working men, even for equal work, is a well-known fact. In this respect, the private employer does not differ from the state or community. When it, women employed in the railroad and postal service receive less than men for the same kind of work. In every community, women teachers receive a lower salary than men teachers. This may be explained by the following causes. Women have fewer needs and are, above all, more helpless. <laughs> okay. Their, earn, earning, bleh, their earnings are in many cases only additional to the incomes of fathers or husbands, the main supporters of the families. The character of female labor is amateurish, temporary and accidental. There is an immense reserve force of female workers which increases their helplessness. There is much competition from middle-class women in dressmaking, millinery, flour and paper goods, manufactory, etc. Women are usually tied to their places of residence. All these causes make the hours of work longest for women unless they are protected by legislation. In a report on the wages of factory laborers in Mannheim in 1893, the late Dr. War Schaffer divides the weekly wages into three classes. The lowest class er, comprises weekly wages up to 15 marks, $3.75. The middle class from 15 to 24 marks, $3.75 to $4, and the high class about 24 marks, $6. An inquiry by the Department of Factory Inspection of Berlin showed that the average weekly wages of working women was 11.36 marks, $2.82. 4.3% received less than 6 marks, 7.8% 6 to 8 marks, 27.6% 12 to 15 marks, 11.1% 15 to 20 marks, and 1.1% 20 to 30 marks. The majority, 75.7%, earn from 8 to 15 marks. In Karlsruhe, the average weekly wages of all working women amounts to 10.02 marks. Wages are lowest in the domestic industries for both men and women, but especially for women, and the hours of work are unlimited. Also, domestic industry frequently implies the so-called sweating system. A subcontractor dis distributes the working among the workers and receives for his re re remuneration a considerable amount of the wages paid by the employer. How wretchedly female labor is paid in these sweated trades may be seen from the following reports on conditions in Berlin. For men's colored shirts, manufacturers paid from two to two and a half marks in 1889. In 1893, they obtained them for 1.20 marks. 
A seamstress of medium ability must toil from dawn to darkness to finish from six to eight shirts daily. Her weekly wages amounts to from four to five marks. An apron maker earns two and a half to five marks weekly. A tie maker, five to six marks. A skillful shirt waist maker, six marks. A very skilled worker on boys' suits, eight to nine marks. A worker on coats, five to six marks. An experienced seamstress on fine men's shirts can earn 12 marks, 12 marks per week if the season is good and if she works from five o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. Milliners who can copy models independently earn 30 marks monthly. Experienced trimmers who have been working at their trade for years earn 50 to 60 marks per month during the season. The season lasts five months. An, an umbrella maker earns six to seven marks weekly with a 12 hour day. Such starvation, starvation wage wages drive down or drive working girls to prostitution for even with the most modest requirements no working girl can live in berlin for less than nine to ten marks per week all these facts show that the modern development of industry draws away women more and more from the family and the how and the home marriage and the family are being disrupted and so from the standpoint of these facts also it becomes absurd to relegate women to the home and the family only they can resort to this argument who go through life blindly and fail to see the trend of development or do not wish to see it. In many branches of industry, women are employed exclusively and a great many, they constitute the majority of workers. And in most of the remaining branches, women find more or less enjoyment. The number of working women is steadily growing and new lines of activity are constantly being opened to them. By the enactment of the German factory laws of 1891, the workday of adult women workers in factories was limited to 11 hours, but a number of exceptions were permitted. Night work for women was also prohibited, but here too, exceptions were made for factories that run day and night, and for manufacturers limited to certain seasons. Only after the International Convention at Bern on September 26, 1906, determined on a night's rest of 11 hours for factory workers, and after socialists for many years energetically demanded the prohibition of night work for women and the establishment of an eight-hour day, the government and the bourgeois parties are yielding at last. The law of December 28, 1908, limits the hours of work for women to 10 hours daily in all factories where no less than 10 workers are employed. On Saturdays and on days preceding holidays, the limit is eight hours. Women, women may not be employed for eight weeks prior to and after their confinement. The readmission depends upon a medical certificate stating that at least six weeks have elapsed since their confinement. Women may not be employed in the manufacture of coke, nor for the carrying of building materials. In spite of the energetic opposition of socialists, an amendment was accepted that the controlling officials may permit overtime work for 50 days annually. Especially noteworthy is the clause which constitutes a first interference with the exploitation by domestic industry. This clause determines that women and minors may not be given work to take home on days when their hours of work in the factory have been as long as the law permits. Regardless of its imperfections, the new law certainly means progress compared to the present state of affairs. But women are not only employed in growing numbers in those occupations that are suited to their inferior physical strength. They are employed wherever the exploiters can obtain higher profits by their labor. Among such occupations are difficult and disagreeable as well as dangerous ones. These facts glaringly contradict that fantastic conception of woman as a weak and tender creature, as described by poets and writers of novels. Facts are stubborn things, and we are dealing with facts only, since they prevent us from drawing false conclusions and indulging in sentimental talk. But these facts teach us, as has been previously stated, that women are employed in the following industries. The textile trades, chemical trades, metallurgy, paper industry, machine manufacture, woodwork, manufacture of articles of food and luxury, and mining above the ground. 
In Belgium, women over 21 are employed in mining underground also. They are furthermore employed in the wide field of agriculture, horticulture, cattle breeding, and the numerous trades connected with these occupations, and in those various trades which have long since been their specific realm, dressmaking, millinery, manufacture of underwear, and as sales ladies, clerks, teachers, kindergarten teachers, writers, artists of all kinds, etc. Tens of thousands of women of the poorer middle class are employed in stores and in other commercial positions and are thereby almost entirely withdrawn from housekeeping and from the care of their children. Lastly, young and especially pretty women find more and more employment as waitresses in restaurants and cafes as chorus girls, dancers, etc., to the greatest detriment to their morals. They are used as bait to attract pleasure-seeking men. Horrible conditions exist in these occupations from which the white sleeve traders draw many of their victims. Among the above named occupations, there are many dangerous ones. Thus, danger from the effects of alkaline and sulfuric fumes exists to a great degree in the manufacture and cleaning of straw hats. Bleaching is dangerous owing to the inhalation of chloral fumes. There is danger of poisoning in the manufacture of colored paper, the coloring of artificial flowers, the manufacture of metachromatypes, chemicals and poisons, the coloring of tin soldiers and other tin toys, etc. Silvering of mirrors means death to the unborn children of pregnant workers. In Prussia, about 22% of all infants die during their first year of life. But among the babies of working women employed in certain dangerous occupations, we find, as stated by Dr. Hurt, the following appalling death rate. Mirror makers, 65% glass cutters, 55%, workers in lead, 40%. In 1890, it was reported that among 78 pregnant women who had been employed in the type, of, the type foundries of the government district of Weisbaden, only 37 had normal confinements. Dr. Hurt asserts that the following trades become especially dangerous to women during the second half of their pregnancy. The manufacture of colored paper and flowers, the finishing of Brussels laces with white lead, the making of metachromatypes, transfer pictures, the silvering of mirrors, the rubber industry in all manufacturers in which the workers inhale poisonous gas, which are such as carbonic acid, carbonic oxide, sulfide of hydrogen, etc. The manufacture of shoddy and phosphoric matches are also dangerous occupations. The report of the factory inspector for Baden shows that the average annual number of premature births among working women increased from 1,039 during the years of 1882 to 1886 to 1,244 during the years 1887 to 1891. The number of births that had to be preceded by an operation were on an average 1,118 from 1882 to 1886 and 1,385 from 1887 to 1891. More serious facts of this sort would be revealed if similar investigations were made throughout Germany. But generally, the factory inspectors in framing their reports content themselves with the remark, particular injuries to women by their employment in factories have not been observed. How could they observe them during their short visits and without consulting medical opinion? That, furthermore, there is great danger to life and limb, especially in the textile trades, the manufacture of explosives and work at agricultural machinery has been shown. Moreover, a number of enumerated trades are among the most difficult and strenuous, even for men, that can be seen by a glance at the very incomplete list. It is very easy to say that this or that occupation is, an, uh, is unsuited to a woman. But what can she do if no other more suitable occupation is open to her? Dr. Hurt gives the following list of occupations in which young girls ought not to be employed at all on account of the danger to their health. Manufacture of bronze colors, manufacture of emery paper, making of straw hats, glass cutting, lithographing, combing flax, picking horse hair, plucking fustian, 
manufacturer of tin plate, manufacturer of shoddy, and work at flax mills. In the following trades, young girls should be employed only if proper protection, sufficient ventilation, etc. has been provided. Manufacture of wallpaper, porcelain, lead pencils, lead shot, volatile oils, alum, prusiate of potash, bromide, quinine, soda, paraffin, and ultramarine, poisonous, colored paper, poisonous, colored wafers, metachromatypes, phosphoric matches, Paris green and artificial flowers. Further occupations on the list are the cutting and assorting of rags, the assorting and cutting of tobacco leaves, assorting of hair for brushes, cleaning with sulfur of straw hats, sulfurizing of India rubber, reeling wool and silk, cleaning bed feathers, coloring and printing of goods, coloring of tin soldiers, packing of tobacco leaves, silvering mirrors, and cutting steel pins and pens. It is certainly no pleasant sight to behold women, even pregnant women, working at the construction of railways, together with men and drawing heavily loaded carts, or helping, or helping with the building of a house, mixing lime and serving as hod carriers. Such occupations strip a woman of all womanliness. Come on. Just as, on the other hand, many modern occupations deprive men of their manliness. Lame. Such are the results of social exploitation and social warfare. Our corrupted social conditions turn the natural order upside down. It is not surprising that working men do not relish this tremendous increase of female labor in all branches of industry. It is certain that the extension of the employment of women in industry disrupts the family life of the working class, that the breaking tip of marriage and the home are a natural result, and that it leads to a terrible increase of immorality, degeneration, all kinds of disease, and infant morality. Infant mortality, perhaps? According to the statistics of the German Empire, infant mortality has greatly increased in those cities that have become centers of industry. And as, as a result, infant mortality is also heightened in the rural districts, owing to the greater scarcity and increased cost of milk. In Germany, infant mortality is greatest in Upper Palatine, Upper Bavaria, and Lower Bavaria. In some localities of the government districts of Lignitz and Breslau and in Chemnitz. In 1907, of every 100 infants, the following percentage died during the first year of life. Statimov, Upper Pal Pal Palatinate, 40.14%. Parsberg, Upper Palatinate, 40.06. Friedberg, Upper Bavaria, 39.28. Kelheim, Lower Bavaria, 37.71, Munich, 37.6, Glockau, or Saxony, 33.48, Waldenburg, or Silesia, 32.49, Chemnitz, 32.49, Reichenbach, Silesia, 32.18, Annaberg, 31.41, etc. In the majority of large manufacturing villages, conditions were still worse, some of which had an infant mortality of from 40 to 50 percent. And yet this social development, which is accompanied by such deplorable result, results, means progress. It means progress just as freedom of trade, liberty of choosing one's domicile, freedom of marriage, etc. meant progress whereby capitalism was favored, but the middle class was doomed. The working men are not inclined to support small tradespeople and mechanics in their attempts again, again to limit freedom of trade and the liberty of choosing one's domicile, and to reinstate the limitations of the guild system in order to maintain in industry on a small scale. Past conditions cannot be revived. That is equally true of the altered methods of manufacture and the altered position of women, but that does not preclude the necessity of protective legislation to prevent an unlimited exploitation of female labor and the employment and in industry of children of school age. In this respect, the interests of the working class coincide with the interests of the state and the general humane 
interests of an advanced stage of civilization. That all parties are interested in such protective measures has frequently been shown during the last decades, for instance, in Germany in 1893, when an increase of the army made it necessary to reduce the required standard, because our industrial system had greatly increased the number of young men who were unfit for military service. Our final aim must be to remove the disadvantages that have been caused by the introduction of machinery, the improvement in the means of production and the modern methods of production, and so to organize human labor that the tremendous advantages machinery gave to humanity will continue to give way to give, continue to give may be enjoyed by all members of society. It is preposterous and a crying evil that human achievements which are the product of social labor, should only benefit those who can acquire them by means of their own power of wealth, while thousands of industrious working men and women are stricken by terror and grief when they learn of a new labor-saving device, which may mean to them that they have become superfluous and will be cast out. What should be joyfully welcomed by all thereby becomes an object of hatred to some, that in former decades frequently led working men to storm factories and demolish the machinery. A similar hostile sentiment prevails to some extent at present between working men and working women. This sentiment is unnatural. We must therefore seek to bring about a state of society in which all will enjoy equal rights regardless of sex. That will be possible when the means of production become the property of society when labor has attained its highest degree of fruitfulness by employing all scientific and technical improvements and advantages, and when, when all who are able to work shall be obliged to perform a certain amount of socially necessary labor, for which society in turn or in return will provide all with the necessary means for the development of their abilities and the enjoyment of life. Woman shall become a useful member of human society, enjoying full equality with man. She shall be given the same opportunity to develop her physical and mental abilities, and by performing duties, she shall be entitled to rights. Being man's free and equal companion, no unworthy demands will be made upon her. The present development of society is tending in this direction, and the numerous and grave evils incidental to this development necessitate the introduction of a new social order.